everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Moving Forward with Dairy Technology webinar series. Um, this is our first uh, webinar in the series. And our topic for today is uh, using time-lapse cameras in dairy facilities. So I'm Brian Doherty. I'm a field agricultural engineer with Iowa State University Extension Outreach. So I'll be kicking off the program today and uh, later on, we'll be uh, joined by Dan McFarland. He's a Ag Engineering Extension Educator from Penn State University. And so he'll be giving us some great information on how to get more value out of time-lapse cameras. So appreciate him taking the time to be here today. Um, the plan for the, the webinar today is uh, we'll go through both presentations and then we'll do a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type those into the chat box and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. So before we start here, I just wanna launch a quick poll. Um, we just wanna kind of get a feel for the audience. Um, if any of you have had any previous experience using a time-lapse camera, you know, on, on your farm or a client's farm. So appreciate it if you just take a second to uh, fill out the poll there. And while you're doing that, I just want to acknowledge uh, that this webinar is supported by, uh, in part, by some funding from a USDA Extension Risk Management Education Grant. So it looks like got a few people here that have, but most of the audience uh, has not used time-lapse cameras. So Appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. And uh, with that, uh, if you give us just a second here, we will get switched over and start the program. Reach. So I'm gonna kick off the series today with uh, just a short talk on using time-lapse camera technology in dairy facilities. So I'll start out with just some of the basics of using time-lapse cameras, you know, what you can use them for in, in a dairy barn, you know, how do you set them up, I'll go through some just basic tips for capturing good quality video with these cameras. And then I'll show a few examples of some video clips that we've captured with these cameras where you can just look at some of the basics of things you, you can do to evaluate animal behavior or troubleshoot some facility design issues and things like that. And later on in the webinar today, uh, Dan McFarland from Penn State University is gonna go into much more detail and in, in some of these uh, uses for the time-lapse cameras. I'm just gonna cover some of the basics here. So why do we wanna use a time-lapse camera? So one of the initial uses for this type of technology was what we would call feed bunk studies. So identifying problems with feed delivery timing or feed push-ups, maybe not being done often enough or lack of bunk space, things like that. So that was one of the initial uses for this technology, but uh, there's a lot more that you can do with these cameras. Evaluating stall usage is another common one. You can look for stall design issues. Maybe cows aren't laying in the stalls like they should be. There's issues with overcrowding, stall avoidance, lack of bedding, things like that. You can pick up with these cameras. You can use them to identify traffic flow bottlenecks in the barn, you know, cow flow issues around robotic milking units, you know, poor positioning of equipment, gating, et cetera. You can also look at barn management activities. You know, are, are your scrapers running as often as they need to? Are the stalls getting cleaned and bedded when they should? Things like that. Heat stress is another one. Uh, you can use these cameras to just kind of evaluate the animal behavior there. Maybe your cows are bunching. You might be able to pick up some things with these time-lapse cameras that you wouldn't otherwise notice you know, just walking through the barn occasionally to observe the cows. Another one that was kind of unexpected that uh, came out of some of this time-lapse work we did was uh, issues with the lighting system. So several of the facilities we put cameras in actually realized that their uh, extended day lighting system wasn't working the way they thought it should. You know, maybe the timers weren't set right or the lights weren't coming on or turning off when they should. Calf behavior is another one. You can use these in calf barns. You know, if you've got automatic calf feeders, that's another good use for these cameras. And then another one is actually suggested by one of the producers that we worked with was uh, they wanted to you know, make a, a 
really short time lapse video of an entire day's activity to put on social media. So I thought that was kind of a neat idea, something you, you could do with these cameras if you want to use them for farm promotional activities or things like that. So we'll get into the basics of the cameras themselves. So what is a time-lapse camera? How does it work? So basically it's just a camera that takes a photo at a preset interval. So you tell it how often you want it to take a picture. And then these newer style cameras will just automatically stitch all of those photos together into a video for you. So when these originally started being used in facilities, it was just a regular camera that would take a picture and then you had to have separate software to actually stitch those photos together to make a video. These newer cameras just do all of that for you and they're very inexpensive. They're very easy to use. So anywhere from a hundred to four hundred dollars you can spend depending on the brand of the camera and the accessories that you get with it. But there's a few important settings that most of these cameras will have. The frame rate is one. So that's just how many images or photos per second it's going to stitch together during the playback. And the capture interval is another important one. That's just how often the camera takes a photo. Light settings uh, found are also quite important. If you want to use these cameras at night when nobody's around, there, there's definitely going to be some settings you're going to have to pay attention to there, some uh, low light or night recording settings that you'll need to turn on in order to get these cameras to work at night. And then image quality is, is another one that's important. Not so much that you need good quality image, but the higher quality of the image is, the larger your file size will be. So I found that a frame rate or a playback speed of around 10 frames per second seems to work pretty well for dairy facilities. Capture interval is really going to you know, depend on what you want to use the camera for. So if you're just wanting to monitor individual animal movement, say you want to be able to pick out a cow out of a group and track that animal around the barn, you're going to need a pretty short capture interval for that. So five to 10 seconds will typically work pretty well there. Whereas if you just want to monitor a feed bunk and just see, do the cows have feed or what time did they run out of feed, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds can be just fine for that, you know, probably somewhere in between for monitoring stalls. I found the lower image quality generally works okay. And, you know, use the high quality images. It'll, it'll fill up your, your memory storage chip in that camera pretty quickly. So you're going to want probably at least 16 gigabyte of memory storage, if not more. Those little memory chips are really inexpensive. They're like the one pictured there, you can buy them for about $5. So I'd encourage you to just go ahead and get a large memory card if you're going to purchase one of these cameras. And again, just any combination of, you know, the higher image quality, the shorter the capture interval, and the longer the recording, the larger your file size is going to be. And that's just kind of illustrated in this table here. So if you want to make a shorter video, what you want to do is either increase your frame rate or the capture interval. And then if you want a smaller file size, you know, you don't want to move huge files around onto your computer. If you want to reduce that image quality. So the table is just, for example, if you have a five second capture interval, you know, 10 frames per second playback speed. If you want to watch a day's worth of activity, that's going to be about a half an hour of video. Whereas if you up that capture interval to say 15 seconds, now you can watch that same day of activity in 10 minutes, but it'll be a little bit harder to pick out, you know, individual cow movement in that case. So mounting these cameras, generally, the higher the better. It just makes it a little easier to see what's going on in the barn. You definitely, if you're going to put this in a dairy facility, you're going to want to buy a weatherproof cover for the camera. So you can see the picture on the left there. It's got a little plastic enclosure around it to keep the moisture and the, the dust out of the camera itself. You want to try to avoid mounting these near fans or extremely dusty areas that might cover your, your plastic lens. And air inlets, Probably won't be a problem unless it's a really cold day. If you've got it right next to a, a curtain or a fan, you might get some fogging on the lens cover that makes it a little hard to see. And you might have to just get a little creative on how and where you mount these. You know, the picture on the right there, you can see I had to bungee cord it to the side of a post because I just couldn't find anywhere else to get that camera situated where it would capture what I wanted to pick up. You also want to make sure you keep the camera secured pretty firmly. So 
In this case, it was just looking at a feed bunk in a dry cow barn. The camera itself was mounted on top of a gate post just with some bungee cords and it was on a flexible tripod. Well, you know, every time somebody went through and opened and closed the gate, the camera kind of got bumped out of place. And, you know, pretty soon you're looking at the wrong end of the cow to be doing a feed bunk study. So make sure you get it uh, securely mounted so you can capture the footage that you need. Another really important feature with these cameras is the timestamp feature. So most of them will come with an internal clock. So as soon as you get it, you want to make sure you set the correct date and time in that camera and turn on that timestamp feature. This is extremely useful because you'll find yourself watching these, these videos and you'll want to see something and you want to know what time did that happen or you know what day did that happen. So if you don't have that turned on, you're not going to have that ability and you lose a lot of the functionality of the camera. So the other thing you want to do when you first get one, if you just put it in for a day or two and then uh, take it down and check your footage, you might find there's issues with lighting or the camera angle and you might have to do some adjustments there. And then I found, you know, I've had several times where the batteries died. So if you're going to install it for, I'd say, longer than a week, I'd recommend just go ahead and put new batteries in and make sure the little display screen on the back of the camera is turned off because that'll really eat up your battery if it's not. So just a few tips for viewing the footage. So you're going to want to probably save these on a hard drive on your computer. Again, these can be quite large files is one of the, the downsides. I found that depending on the external storage device, whether it's a thumb drive or external hard drive, Sometimes the video will lag or just won't play at all if, if you don't have enough processing speed there. So you probably want to save it right on your hard drive. And then there's some different options for watching the video. You can use just a regular Windows media player if you've got a Windows machine. And you may be able to tweak it, speed the video up, slow it down a little bit by going into the play speed settings. You know, you could do the same thing if you have a Mac, you know, quick time player, you can just click the four rewind buttons. But Probably a better option for watching the videos is uh, the software that might actually come with the camera. So I'm not here to recommend any brands or try to sell cameras. The, the Breno is the model that we happen to use. And that comes with some free software that's it's just a much better experience watching the videos back with the, the software that comes with the camera. You can speed it up, you can slow it down, you can rewind it, you can cut out small clips just a lot of functionality that you don't have with your regular media player on a, on a laptop. So that's something I'd recommend you look for if you're gonna purchase a camera, look for one that's got some uh, video player software that comes with it. And then just kick back and make some popcorn and enjoy the show. You're gonna to wanna to set aside some time to watch these videos. You'll find yourself backing them up several times and looking at different things. and you might have a fair amount of time invested and in, even though it's, it's capturing a, a long period of time and compressing that down into a shorter viewing period, if you want to get good use out of this, you still have to set aside the time to, to sit through those videos. So I've come across some challenges with, with uh, some of the installations and just want to walk through some of those and show you what some of the issues can be. So. These are just some screenshots from some camera installations. So the one on the left there, that camera is, it's in a decent place, but it could be mounted a little bit higher to get a good view of the feed alley there. But then you see what happens even with the night settings turned on, once the lights turned off in the barn, it, it threw the shadow just right so that you couldn't see what was happening at the feed alley there. So again, you might have to, you know, play around with your nighttime lighting a little bit or try to reposition that camera to avoid some of those issues. Same facility here, just on the other side, this camera's mounted a little bit higher, so you can see you got a better viewing angle there. But again, the same problem, once the lights turned off at night, there was a shadow right across the whole feed bunk and you, you couldn't see what was happening. Here's just one more example in a calf barn. So it doesn't take much light at all for these cameras to be able to still see at night, but you do have to have some light. So once the light's turned off here, basically this is what your video is gonna look like on the right side there. It's basically just gonna be a black screen and you're not gonna be able to see anything. So you do have to have a little bit of light to get these to work during the night hours. 
So what I want to do now is just show a few video examples of some of the footage we've captured and some of the different things that you can look for. So crowding issues around robots, you know, cow flow issues, things like that, issues with lighting and facilities. So this was a, the first installation we did. So normally, if you want to see what's happening around a robot, you would want to put the camera on the outside to kind of look at the cow flow. But we were just playing around with the camera here to see what would happen. So you can see a couple of cows come through the robot here, you know, nice, pretty clear image there. But uh, you'll notice a cow come in here, kind of in the center of the image there, and she just stands there for about a half an hour blocking that gate. So that was kind of interesting. If you watch the, the robotic arm on the right side there, it milks four cows in, in the time period that this cow here is kind of standing there blocking the gate. You know, it looks like she's in the fetch pen. This is actually a different cow that pushes her out of the way and comes in and gets milked. So that cow is still out there. And then you'll see her come back here again. And then she finally decides to come in the robot. So just one of those things that you can pick up with the, the time-lapse footage. Here's another facility with uh, a robotic milking system installed. So it's interesting to look at different times of the day and see what's happening in the barn. So this is about nine o'clock in the morning. Hopefully you can see the timestamp on the bottom there. See, so it's pretty quiet. You know, you got a cow in heat here. They chase each other around in the circle a few times. But in general, you know, no crowding issues at all around the robot. Now here we're a little bit later in the day. So it's about uh, 3.30 here. You know, they're bringing some fetch cows in. So now we've got a big group in, in the fetch pen there. So that robot on the right side is, is kind of tied up. because You've got cows waiting there. And if you just watch what happens over time, you'll just kind of gradually see more and more cows start to congregate in front of the robots here. So this is on a five second capture interval, just to give you an idea of what that looks like in a, a 10 frame per second playback speed. But you'll see cows come up and you know they'll try to go to the first robot and that one's busy, they go down to the second one. And so not a huge crowding issue here, but there is some you know cows standing around waiting to get into the robot. And eventually, you know, the, the fetch pen empties out and then the, the crowding issue basically goes away. You can see here, you can also have a pretty good view of monitoring the stalls here at the same time, if that's something that you wanna to try to do with the camera. You can try to monitor you know, several different areas of the barn at the same time, if you can get a good installation location. Here's one more example. So this is actually the photo where I showed the camera strapped to the side of the post. It's probably a little bit too far away to really get a good view of what's happening around the robots here. So there's three, robots on the far side there, but really wasn't a great place to mount the camera. And that's something you just might run into sometimes. You can see, you know, a little bit of crowding there earlier in the day. And now here's a little bit later on, not as busy. So now we're about uh, 10 o'clock, 1030 at night here. And you'll see the lights turn off in the barn, but really good lighting around the, the robots themselves in this facility. So no problem seeing what's happening at night. Here's the same farm, just a different barn. Now we're facing to the west and you can see an issue there with sunlight coming in that west curtain and kind of creating some glare and making it a little bit harder to see what's happening in the video there. So again, these are the, the kind of things that you might run into when you're trying to capture footage. You might have to reposition your camera to avoid some of that. Another thing you can look at is uh, you know, issues with stall usage, perching, stall avoidance. Again, uh, Dan McFarland is going to go into this in much more detail, but just want to show a few issues here. This is one of our early camera installations. So very nice facility here with a automated milking system. But you can see a few cows in the center there, you know, just kind of hanging out, perching in the stalls, you know, kind of half in and half out. So could be a lot of different things going on there. You'd have to kind of look into that issue more, but really good nighttime lighting in this facility. So no problem at all seeing the entire barn, even at night with, you know, the amount of light they had there. So same facility here, just on a different day. So it's kind of interesting here, if you watch this white cow on the right side here, you know, playing around, she goes into a stall, digs out a bunch of sand, goes across, you know, 
digs some more sand out, doesn't like either of them stalls. You know, cows just kind of play around sometimes and goes into a third stall, digs out some more sand. And so if you're curious, you know, who's, you know, being a troublemaker out in the barn, these cameras can be a good way to pick out the, which cows are, are causing the issues. Here's one more facility uh, just to kind of show you some of the issues with trying to mount these cameras. So we were trying to capture the whole barn with one camera, which really didn't work that well in this case. Ideally, you'd probably have two different cameras. And you'll see what happens as the, as the lighting system turns on, you start to get some glare there and it just re becomes really hard to see what's actually happening in the free stalls. And so you probably need to move those cameras and then you see the lighting system turns off and it's again, completely dark in this particular barn and you can't really see what's happening at night. So a couple more examples here, uh, monitoring feed bunks. So again, you can look for feed delivery timing issues, you know, feed push up. So here's a installation in a, in a nice facility. So this is on a 10 second, capture interval just to give you an idea of what that looks like and you can see a little bit of distortion in the video there and uh, it, in a second here it'll switch to the next day and so now it's a, a very distorted image so what happened here is I had mounted this camera on a tripod right next to a, a big uh, tunnel ventilation fan and so when that fan would kick on it's actually vibrating the whole wall and causing the camera to vibrate so again something to keep in mind Here's the same facility. Now this camera is just mounted on the opposite end of the barn, but now we're on a 20 second capture interval. So you can see how much faster everything is moving here. So it's a little bit harder to, you know, track cows around as, as they move back and forth, but you can still get a good idea of stall usage and things like that. You know, how often your feed pushers and scrapers are running, if, if things are set up the way they should be and working the way they should be. But you see on the right hand side there that feed alley is getting a little thin on feed there quite a few cows eating up in the far pen on the right side but not many cows at all up and eating down in this closer pen the ones that do come up to eat you know they have to kind of work at it working back and forth down the row there so a little bit short on feed in that case here's another facility um, this is about four o'clock in the morning so again, you see cows down on the far end eating. The, the automatic feed pusher is running every half hour here. So I've got this sped up quite a bit just to kind of show what happens here. But you can see not a lot of feed on uh, the end closer to the camera here. And so the feed pusher keeps running and then about 6.30, it stops. And so I, I, that could be intentional or otherwise, I don't really know. But again, not a lot of feed to be had up on the, the close end of the barn there. and then. You know, that goes on until about 8.30 and then uh, they come through and uh, clean up the feed bunk and then immediately come in and deliver feed about five minutes later. Same facility on a different day here. So you can see more feed availability this time. So they do come in, they push the feed up, but in this case, you know, maybe something happened while they were mixing feed. So this goes on for about a half of an hour, you know, and then the feed wagon comes through and dumps feed. So again, probably not a huge issue, but a little bit of time lag there between uh, cleanup and when the fresh feed was delivered. So those are just a few uh, basic examples of the things you can look at with these cameras. So just to kind of summarize things, there's a lot of different uses for these. So I'd, I'd encourage people to just play around with these. These cameras are pretty inexpensive if you wanna just buy one and uh, see what you can see on your own farms. But you know, put some thought into setting these cameras up properly and installing them properly so you can really get some useful video back out because it's really a great way to identify opportunities to improve, it could be management or maybe tweak your facility design a little bit. And the key with these time lapses is it's often things that you just don't notice or they go unidentified because it's just not possible to have somebody there 24 hours a day watching what's happening. So these cameras are a great way to have some eyes in the barn when you otherwise wouldn't have anybody there. And they're just, they're quite inexpensive. It's really a cheap technology that you can use to help improve profitability. So I'm gonna wrap up there and turn it over to Dan McFarlane and we will take questions at the end. Thanks for watching.
Well, hello, I'm Dan McFarland. I'm an agricultural engineering educator based in South Central Pennsylvania. And uh, first of all, I wanna thank Brian and the Iowa State uh, Extension and Outreach Dairy Team for inviting, inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar today. It's good to be in Iowa, even though it's virtual and involved with my alma mater. Time-lapse photography is a wonderful way to evaluate cow, cow behavior and facility management. But uh, how do we know what to do once we've got it? It's fun to watch, but how do we know if it's working? I think first we need to understand typical cow behavior. Rick Grant at Minor Institute in Shazy, New York has spent a lot of time uh, studying cows either by video and in person and came up with this dairy cow daily time budget. What he found was that cows eat three to five hours per day, rest 12 to 14 hours a day, have social interactions two to three hours a day, ruminate seven to 10 hours a day, most of that time spent resting, drinking a half hour a day and outside the pen, whether it's milking or travel, two and a half to three hours a day. Cows rest somewhere in the range of 10 to 14 hours a day, whether it's free stalls, tie stalls, bedded pack or compost bedded packs. If it's a dry, comfortable resting area that they can use, they'll find it and they'll find it and use it properly. Grant also looked at the top 10% producing cows in the group versus the average cows. Now average cows are top of the bottom half, but what he found is that top 10% of those cows were resting more than two hours a day more than the average cows. This meant that those average cows were either standing in alleys or perching in stalls for that remainder of time. There's a lot of ben benefits to providing a quality resting area. Reduce stress on the feet, which will reduce lameness. There's reduced injuries because of the comfort that they have there. They're cleaner and a lot more fun to milk. There's improved milk production and also increased longevity. The greatest effect on poor stall design may be on lame cows in any given herd. Measuring resting area performance is done with a, a number of ways. First is locomotion scoring, which is usually an indicator of how well the stalls are used or if there is reluctance or refusal to use them. Hawk assessments are usually an indicator of the condition of the stall bed and the bedding practices. And then hygiene scoring is usually an indicator of how the stall uh, beds are managed as well as alley cleaning. Stall size and structure is very important in free stalls. Cows do not crawl into stalls, they lie down on them. What I like to see is a structure that allows the largest cows in the group to get into a stall, stand all four feet on the stall surface, backbone level, front and rear legs square under her, and maybe just touching the neck rail. If she's in this position, I'm very confident that she can go into the reclining position, rest comfortably, and also rise when she needs to. If a cow is standing in the stall with her head above the rail, pressing hard against it, perching half in or half out of the stall, or standing diagonally in the stall, it's an indicator that the neck rail is either too low or too far back. There are four common resting positions for a cow. The short position where her head is back on her ribs. This is her deepest slumber and usually occurs about an hour and a half or more a day. The narrow position, she's laying rather um, vertically with one or more of her, one or both of her front legs extended forward. The wide position, she's turned a little more laterally with uh, the front and rear leg uh, extended to the side. And then the long position. These aren't the only positions, but they're the most common that we'll see. Cows need to be up on the resting surface. They can't be hanging off the back. And so the, the amount of resting space they're given is very important. If they don't have enough, they're hanging off the back, they, it creates this restless or unsettled posture. And with this posture, there's a lot more rear leg movement, which can turn into hock abrasions and swelling. If we can get that cow up on the stall, and I like to see her maybe four to six inches ahead of the rear curb, she's in a more restful posture that leg movement almost stops. And so the chance of hock injury is greatly reduced. Also as an added benefit, the cow will bring her tail up on the stall rather than laying it in the alley. It's also important when evaluating 
um, time-lapse video to look at stall use at more than one time during the day. When I was doing this with a clipboard and, and a pencil, pencil and paper, I would always wait, take one evaluation, and then wait at 45 minutes to an hour, take another one, and then possibly another 45 minutes an hour to take another one to get a better idea of how the, the area is being used. For example, in this video, I took screenshots at 9, 12 a.m. And you see that stall use is pretty good. It's about an hour and a half after milking. The cows are in the stalls. And while I do see some positioning and some issues with the, the stall structure, the stalls are being used in this, in this case. Now at two in the afternoon, there's a lot more standing, perching in the stalls, standing in the alley, standing in the stalls, a lot less resting in the stalls. This could be because of stall comfort, but it could be also because of heat stress. Heat stress affects resting behavior and cows tend to stand more in hot weather, probably because they can expose more of their body to the environment than they can when they're resting. Some of the stall use metrics that are used is the cow comfort index, which is an indicator of the cows resting in the stalls. It, used, it uh, takes the number of cows lying in the stalls and divides it by the total number of cows touching the stalls. Now the total number of cows touching the stalls includes those resting, standing in the stall or perching in the stall. And we like to see that number greater than 0.85. Also the stall standing index. This is an indicator of cows standing there for no reason. It takes the number of cows standing in the stall, divides it by the total number of cows touching the stall. Again, those that are resting, standing and perching. We like to see that number less than 0.2. If it's greater than 0.2, it's an indicator that lameness may be an issue in that group. Here's an evaluation I did last October in a three row freestall shelter with 115 cows and 111 freestalls. What the producer was worried about or concerned with is when he came out for morning milking, there were maybe 45 to 50 cows standing in the stalls. And he thought that was uh, not necessarily normal. The temperature, high temperatures during that time are about 66. So it's in the kind of the comfort zone of the cows. So heat stress shouldn't have been a problem. And so here we are at four o'clock in the morning and take it through to about midnight. Now you can see there's periods where the cows come back from milking, they go right to eat. And then after they're done eating, they'll go and lay down. And so you'll see times where there's pretty good stall use as far as resting, but you also notice that there's a lot of stall standing and a lot of stall of perching. And what's really nice about the cameras that we're using now is it comes with software that allows you to look at it frame by frame. And so you can go to certain times of the day, take a screenshot, uh, actually try to count the cows and uh, evaluate them that way. It makes it a lot more easier, not only to present it to the producer, but also get a better idea of what's going on throughout the entire day uh, with stall use and feeding behavior and so on. So here's an example, this is four o'clock. It's about an hour, hour and a half before milking. And it appears to be pretty good, at least in most of the barn here, pretty good uh, resting, especially close to, uh, close to the camera. So a little overpopulated, but pretty much one-to-one -one here in this particular uh, situation. So we take it and we look, there's one cow eating, there's five that are standing idle in the stall in the alleys, 25 that are standing in the stalls, five that are perching. And so that means that about 79 of the cows are resting at this particular time. We look at the cow comfort index and that's below that 0.85. So there, are, there is some excessive standing going on. We look at the stall standing index and we see that it's, it's also greater than 0.2, which uh, might be an indicator that uh, this could be a problem. We look at five o'clock, which is about a half hour before milking, and you can see that probably cows are standing in anticipation of going to the milking parlor. So it may not be the best time to evaluate stall use. As we go through that, we see the cow comfort uh, index at this time because it's not taking into account those cows that are at the feed bunk or standing idly in the stalls. It's only the ones touching the stalls. Uh, still, it's way below that 0.85. And, and, and greater than that 0.2 in the stall standing index. Cows have a secular behavior, uh, resting behavior. Um, 
usually the lowest stall use uh, in, in any situation is one hour post milking. And that's because there's a high percentage of the cows uh, at the feeding area. After that one hour is a good indicator of, of stall use because there's a sharp increase during the next few hours of stall use. And then stall use is usually pretty high during the night and early morning hours. So there's a stall use index, which I think is useful. It's one I like to use the most because it does take into account the cows that are eating, which is a behavior that we want to encourage. It's an indicator of how well the stalls are being used. And again, measured an hour or more, usually between an hour and three hours after returning from the morning milking. It takes the number of cows lying in the stalls divided by the cows that are not eating. And we want to see an indice somewhere greater than 0.75. So if we look at here at uh, eight o'clock, which is uh, after milking in this particular case, there's 10 cows eating, three that are standing idle in the, the alleys. Um, so there's 102 cows that are not eating. And then there's eight cows standing, but none perching in this particular thing. So that means about 94 of the cows are resting. And we can see that the cow comfort index, the stall standing index, and also the stall use index are all in the green, all greater than what we, uh, greater or less, depending on what you're looking at, we wanna see. And so it looks pretty good at this particular time. But at 10 o'clock, we start to see more standing and perching in the stalls. And so going through all that, we see uh, that the, the, the uh, because there's a lot of cows at the feed bunk, stall use is really pretty good for those that are using it. And so it's in the ranges that we like to see. At, uh, at noon, a lot more standing, but still a lot of the cows up feeding again. And so the, we start to see though, in this case, because there's more of that standing and perching that's going on uh, in the stalls, we start to fall below uh, the de desired amount of cows and cow comfort index, the stall standing index is increased and so on. This is a study another ag engineer, John Tyson and I did a few years ago, looking at a group of cows where they were considering doing some improvements to the stall bed. And uh, using this, I was using different equipment. And so was using five minute intervals uh, in this and using the stall use index. We did a recording a week before and a week after the improvements were made and compared them. So here's a week before, they were using some pretty worn out mattresses with a light um, bedding of uh, sawdust, light layer of sawdust in there. You can see some stall use issues as far as hanging off the back of the stalls and extending their leg off the stalls and so on. A lot of standing, a lot of perching in that particular case. What they did was put a, a bedding retainer at the back of the stall and, and uh, increase the bedding amount to about three inches of sand. Here's after the improvements were made. And when you look at the time lapse, you don't see a whole lot of difference in stall use when you're looking at it at this speed. However, when you go frame by frame, and do the evaluations for stall, the stall use index like we did, we saw there was a difference. Um, before it was the stall use index uh, was 0.43 to 0.67, below that 0.75 that we really like to see. But after this bedding retainer and the sand were um, used, we saw indice increase from 0.71 to 0.92. Now I was concerned about this 0.71, but I think what was happening there is that by adding three inches of sand to the stall bed, it had decreased the space between the stall bed and the neck rail uh, by about three inches. And so it made it more difficult for cows to get into. I think if the neck rail was adjusted to accommodate that difference in the stall bed height, we would have seen higher numbers, probably way above that 0.75 and into that 0 0.92, 0 0.95. Uh, had we made that adjustment as well. But in the summary, we're talking to the uh, producer and his profit team. Uh, certainly average stall use improved uh, when the bedding retainer and sand were added. And the cows seemed to be in a more restful posture. Their, their legs weren't hanging off the back of the stalls. Uh, there was a lot more cushion and comfort for them. Uh, and so they seemed to be more attracted to the stalls. Um, also, there was improved acceptance of the outside row of stalls, which is a concern earlier um, in the uh, before. I think, again, if the current neck rail placement had been changed, uh, it would have reduced the incidence of perching and stall standing after the improvement was made. 
But something else that always comes to mind, was it the sand or was it more bedding that made the difference as far as stall use? And in my opinion, I think more bedding. My experience has been that the more bedding you give the cow, the more likely they are to use the stall. They really don't care if it's sand or, or sawdust shavings or even dry manure solids. If it's a thick layer of bedding, they'll find it. The producer, however, wasn't convinced after we had shown him the videos. Um, and he said, I have never, I don't see the improvement that you're, you've noted in the, in the research or in the study here. Uh, but what I found out, I took this picture, just a still picture later um, after, the, after the study, and I thought it was pretty common, but he had only observed this group while he was feeding them. And so he, while they were feeding, they were more interested in the feed perhaps than resting. So he didn't see this kind of behavior. Uh, in the bin, but it was actually happening. Stocking density is also important when we consider the behavior of, of cows in the stalls. Overpopulating groups uh, puts more pressure on the feed, puts more pressure on the stalls. And so it, it, uh, it needs to be considered when you're evaluating stalls with time lapse. There are a couple ways to calculate it. You can take the total number of cows minus the total number of stalls, divided by the total number of stalls, divide it or, and, and uh, multiply it by 100, and you'll get a percentage. I think it's a lot easier. I use what I call the population, which is basically just dividing uh, the total number of cows by the total number of stalls. I think it's a better indicator of what's happening in the group, meaning in this case that 1.2 cows are available per stall. There was a study done at Cornell a number of years ago uh, in a two row freestall group um, in where they had one group uh, was not overcrowded. There were 20 cows and 20 stalls. And then the other was 30% overcrowded with 26 cows on 20 stalls. And what they found was the average stall use in 48 hours was typically 61% with the uh, evenly populated group and about 91% in the overpopulated group. Now, if you're taking a test, 91 is better than 61. However, when you're evaluating stalls, that means those stalls are being used hard and there's cows standing and waiting for stalls, which can lead to some problems. Here's an example of that. Now, stall use in this video looks very good. Look, almost all of those stalls are being used uh, through this entire clip, uh, but there's a lot of cows at the feed bunk as well. Don't be fooled by overstocking when you're trying to use some of these indices we discussed earlier. Because we look at the population of this group, there's 114 cows with 81 stalls available to them. So about 1.41 cows per stall. So there's a lot of competition for, for uh, stalls in this particular group. We look at the cow comfort index and by looking there, we see that 78 cows are resting or uh, resting while 80 cows or either total cows are in that way above what we're looking for in that 0.85. The stall st standing index is actually really low uh, because of that stall use that you see. And the stall use index is greater than 0.75 as well, which we'd all think was really good, but because it's overpopulated, it's absolutely worthless. Because when you watch this video, you see there's a lot of competition for those stalls. There's a lot of aggression that happens. Cows come in and, and uh, knock cows out of stalls so they can use it. And also this group that's standing at the feed bunk is the first to go to the milking center. And when they come back, they don't even go by the feed. They just go find a stall and lie down and take it and lay there for a while. So I wanna show you just a couple more uh, stall use. This is a six row facility, uh, about 600 cows with uh, 125 stall groups, uh, fairly evenly populated with uh, generously bedded stalls, sand stalls. But I also took some shots overhead using one to three frames per second. So I could get an idea how these stalls were being used. And they're, they're absolutely terrific. You see the stalls are readily used. You see that cows will get up and, and lay down in the same stall, uh, may laying down on the other side, which is a common, common behavior. You can see them ruminating. They're, they're uh, really chewing their cuds there. But you'll see cows using the stalls. They'll leave. Another cow will come in right away and use it. They're getting good comfort. Uh, extending the legs, you see all the resting positions that we mentioned earlier. Here's another facility with some challenges. It was some worn out mattresses with lightly bedded and some stall structure adjustments made to keep the stalls clean. So the neck rail is a little far back 
and the brisket locator was also positioned a little far back, all in an effort to keep the stalls clean. When you look at the head-to-head -head rows there overhead, you see that there's not enough resting space. They're resting diagonally. There's a lot of refusal. Cows will enter the stalls, but they're either perching or standing in the stall, and then they'll leave. They won't rest in the stalls. Uh, so there's a lot of reluctance uh, to use these. There's some big improvements that could be made to these stalls as far as neck rail position, brisket locator position, and stall management. Can you tell the difference here between the free stall cow and the tie stall cow? The most common answer I get is the free stall cow has a number and the tie stall cow has a name. But I think their genetics are probably pretty similar. And so here's an example of a tie stall facility. I think that has some good size and structure um, complements to their, to their stalls. And so this is about an eight, a short clip of about eight hours of the stall use. But what you see during this clip is all the resting positions that we're after. The short position, the chain's long enough to allow her to, to put her back, head back on her ribs very comfortably. We see that long position. The uh, front curb is low enough to allow her to do that relatively comfortably. Uh, also, they have the long position and the wide position there. There's enough space for those cows to do. But something from an animal welfare point that you also see is, you know, they are do have readily available food to eat, uh, water to drink, as well as uh, the opportunity to look around and also groom and be groomed. As far as feeding area management and observation, uh, some of the guidelines that I've been uh, given are that feed should be available to cows and cows should be available to feed about 21 hours a day. A TMR delivered two or more times per day, a target for refusal about 3% and a bunk density at 100% or less. Also, it's important to keep feed within reach and so pushback is needed. And one of the, recommend, recommend, one of the recommendations that Dennis Armstrong, University of Arizona, uh, uh, suggests is that for half hour push-ups, two hours post feeding. It only takes about 20 to 30 minutes for the first cows at the feed bunk to sort and push feed far enough away so the next cows that come up to the feed bunk can't reach it easily. And so he suggests for the two hours post feeding to push up feed every half hour in that two hour period and really focus on when the cows wanna come up and eat and not how often you're just pushing feed back. And so I think that's important that you need to, to accommodate their behavior and when they wanna get that feed and have it in reach when they're um, available. How much feeding space is enough? Well, this is a screenshot I took from a, a time-lapse video that I took of this group. And the maximum number of cows I would see between these 12 foot posts was five. They preferred four if there wasn't any crowding there, but five was the maximum you would see. So you take five cows and divide that by um, 12 feet or 144 inches, and that's 28.8. That's the, the minimum feed space that cows really like. If we look at two row facility here at the top of this diagram and the three row facility at the bottom, the three row facility has 33% less feed space compared to that two row facility. And so that means that only about 75 or 80 cows at the most can get to that feed area at the same time. Um, 75 to 80% of the cows can get to the feed bunk. And so what's that mean for the 25% that can't, that feed needs to be within reach. And so that pile of feed needs to be higher, wider, or put down more often so that those cows all have equal access to that feed. Also access to the feed with crossovers. Typically we don't like to go more than 15 or 20 stalls or 50, 60 to 80 feet between crossovers. That allows better access uh, to the feeding area uh, from the stalls, especially in a three row group where 67% of the stalls are in an alley away from feed. And cows prioritize rest and will choose rest rather than the eating when both lying time and feeding time are limited. And so we look in the time away from pen as well as overcrowding, we see where the priority lies. So here, this producer asked me to uh, do an observation of feeding 
behavior as well as delivery and push up uh, during that because he was concerned that at night, his nighttime crew wasn't doing the best job. And uh, I can tell you for the weeks that this time-lapse camera was up, they did a really good job. There was feed usually available to cows. Uh, it was cleaned up, pushed back within reach uh, pretty much most of the time. So it really wasn't a concern, at least when the cameras were up. Here's another uh, facility where uh, feed and reaching the feed was uh, a concern. And actually they really didn't realize it until I had shown them this, um, this video. And so fortunately, uh, it's a uh, herd where they milk two, twice a day and also deliver feed twice a day. And so milking is done usually around 4.30 in the morning. So feed is started deliver there and then 4.30 in the afternoon. It's a six row facility, three groups on either side, just minimal overpopulation in this particular one. But you can see as cows are eating, it doesn't take long before that feed is out of reach. Fortunately, this video convinced them to put more feed down and also to buy an automatic feed pusher so that feed was in reach when cows wanted it. Compare that to this particular video. This is an older 1980s facility where they had made some ventilation and stall improvements in that. But also, I just thought it was really a good example of having feed available and cows available to feed um, throughout the entire day. This herd, despite of its facility challenges, uh, teeters two to three pounds either side of 100 pounds per cow per day. And I think the feed management probably has a lot to do with that. Just one more observation. This is a building that was built recently in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, as a result of a barn fire, they built a new facility. It's a compost pack facility with 120 milking cows. They have uh, two milking robots. They also have automatic feed mixing and delivery and pushback, as well as uh, little vacuum manure collectors that will uh, take care of the alley cleaning. So I'll run the video here. The uh, uh, feed delivery unit comes out and feeds the cows. And then about every 60 to 90 minutes, it will come out and push feed back and also measure the amount of feed that's left in the feed line. And if it's below a certain level, uh, it will go back, mix up a batch of feed and deliver it to that particular group. So I'll just run it and let it go here. I think it's pretty neat to see all this automation automation taken care of. What they have found out with this particular group though, or this particular uh, system, is that you still need to monitor the feed bunk as well as uh, make sure that, that everything is, all the automation is working as you expect it. Um, in one instance, uh, they had been doing some work on the silos and forgot to turn them back on. And so later in the Early evening, uh, the uh, mixer had called them and said, I'm unable to mix feed because the unloaders wouldn't run. So they uh, came out and they found that the bunks were uh, completely clean and uh, the cows had found a way to eat it all. Uh, but it uh, was still a, a good idea to, to be able to observe what's going on, even though the automation is doing the work. Also, heat stress is a concern here in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. And so generally, here's another study we did looking at uh, circulation fans. Uh, typically, fans are installed blowing in one direction, usually with the prevailing wind uh, down the length of the barn over stalls and also over the feeding area. Uh, in this example, um, this dairy was experiencing some bunching during the summer. 
and uh, wanted, wanted us to look into it. The existing fans that were in the barn measured or installed blowing air from uh, uh, west to east uh, were performing as expected uh, as far as air speeds at the stall and, and feeding area and evaporative cooling was in use, but they were still seeing some bunching. We installed some time-lapse cameras to monitor that shelter for a few days. Uh, this is uh, the first day and they, at 9 a.m., you can see stall use is pretty good. Cows are at the feeding area. Uh, we're on, we're at looking from the west end of the building, but at noon, you start to see cows bunching uh, towards the middle and the other end. And still occurring at 3.30 and then also later in that evening, early evening. Uh, but what they found out is the fans weren't starting until it was 70 degrees. So they made the adjustment to set the fans so they'd start at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And here just a few days later is what you see. 9 a.m. in the morning, stall use at the west end is pretty good. Stays pretty good at noon. Uh, varies a little bit at 3.30. But you still see them favoring this end of the barn now compared to what you saw before. And so just by lowering the temperature um, that the fans came on, it made a big difference in stall use there. Now, through a couple years of observation, wondering why cows bunch where they bunch, uh, it always seemed to me that cows were seeking the air movement. And so they would move towards the fans, even in the opposite direction that the fan was blowing the air. And so they always kind of favored that end of the barn. And so I always wondered if you set it up so that half the fans blew one way and half the fans blew the other way, what would happen? Would they have more choices to face? Because cows like to face a breeze. If it's raining, they probably, they usually put their butts to the, to the breeze. But if it's just air, they like to, like to face towards that. And so um, I was telling this to a farmer one day who was having some severe bunching problems at the west end of the barn. He says, Dan, I'll try it. And he called me the day, he, uh, two days later, he said, I didn't believe it. I, I mounted fans so they were blown in either direction and the cows spread out and, uh, and used all the stalls. And I was a little wary because, you know, maybe it's just, just happened once. It was a sample of one. Uh, but I called him after a period, a week period of uh, very hot, humid weather that we usually have in the end of July, first part of August. And I called him after that and I said, how did it work? He said, to that whole period, they spread out. And so uh, several farmers have done this uh, and found similar results uh, in their barns when they do that. I don't know why cows do that. Uh, and I've told people that when cows start talking to me, I'm getting out of this business, uh, but I do like to watch and see what cows are doing. So this was another example uh, where they did try this. Um, they, in that same summer, they were getting cows bunching during the daytime. So installed the time-lapse camera for several days. And what they did is took east end fans and flipped them to point west. Uh, point west. Actually, it was a group of fans. It was four fans. And uh, what they did is they left two of them blowing from west to east. And then they took the third one that was blowing from west to east, removed it, took it to the far end of the barn, turned it east. And then the remaining fan, they just flipped. So it was blowing uh, to the west. And so here's what we got at two in the morning and the fan we're looking uh, from the east in this particular one. The first fans you see there over the head to head stalls are the ones that they flipped. And then beyond that are two sets of fans that are now blowing from west to east. So half of them are blowing from uh, west to east, half are blowing east to west. There's a fan that's just out of the sight of the camera in this particular uh, situation. So at 2 a.m. you see this, this is before, so they're all blowing in the same direction in this particular um, observation. But now you start to see that bunching again, moving the cows are moving to the west here in this case, because the fans are running, they're finding more comfort, even though there's evaporative cooling uh, at the bunk, as well as uh, uh, fans over the stalls. At 3 p.m., they're really tight uh, up against there. And it's 87 degrees in this particular observation. A few days later, uh, 90 degrees, high temperature. Now the fans, the fan that you see there has been flipped below uh, to the west, and there's a fan close to the uh, uh, close to the camera that is now blowing from east to west as well. So cows are pretty much spread out, stay spread out. Really pretty good use with the acceptance of the outside row. 
And that's usually because there's some, uh, might be some sunlight intrusion coming in there. And at 3 p.m. you see that, but a lot better stall use here at the east end compared to uh, previously. So time-lapse was useful for that. Time-lapse away from the pens, easy to do. Uh, you can use the time-lapse that you're using and just see when they go. Time away from the pen uh, is important. We like to limit it to less than three hours a day because cows, are, cows need that resting and feeding time and the availability to those things. And so you simply say, oh, when the cows leave the pen, in this case, the last cow left at 11.45 and the last cow returned at 1 p.m. It's a 3X herd. Uh, and so it's about three hours and 45 minutes, still a little over what we prefer, but it's really remarkable. I've, uh, I've in number of time lapses, I've, I've had cows away from five and a half to six and a half hours a day. Uh, so they don't have access to feed or water during that, feed water or resting time during that time. And it certainly affects uh, their behavior. I also started doing some uh, group pen observations as well. Uh, group PEM calf operations with ad lib feeding, uh, mainly just to, to look at their behavior throughout the entire day, as well as what else is happening. So here's an example um, of uh, a group calf with ad lib feeding, uh, 20 calves per pen in this particular situation, about 50 square feet of, of space uh, per calf, uh, really a well-run system. It's a naturally ventilated building with uh, positive pressure tubes that are providing uniform distribution of fresh air during, during colder weather. Uh, it was really helpful, I found out, to have those uh, heat lamps over the, um, over the nipples uh, on during the night, uh, during the colder weather, because it allowed me to do a lot better observation. Uh, unfortunately, when the temperature warmed up, they weren't used, and so uh, things went dark. But uh, I just wanted to get an idea of not only how the calves use the bedded area as well as uh, milking activity, but we're, I was able to look at what was happening during the nighttime. Also milk station activity, if they were doing it as a group singularly or whatever, but also the bedding and cleaning intervals uh, that were going on, as well as the caregiver interaction uh, to those calves. And uh, uh, I've done a number of these now from uh, when the pen is being filled to when the pen is being emptied. And uh, it's been very helpful in how I recommend designs for uh, uh, group craft facilities, as well as helping with the management um, techniques of those as well. So in summary, uh, you know, where we started, time-lapse photography can be an excellent tool in the evaluation of cow behavior and facility management. Uh, but you need to become familiar with typical cow behavior. And you need to be objective when you're watching um, to see what's going on. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, abnormal behavior becomes normal if it's repeated over and over. And so I uh, need to keep that in mind as well because strange things will happen. And don't be, you know, record before and after improvements. If you're considering improvements, uh, go ahead and, and uh, uh, do it before and after so that you can see if there's a difference and expect to be surprised because there will always be something that comes up uh, that's a little different uh, in these videos that, that, that might surprise you. So with you, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Also, uh, thank Brian and, and the group again, the dairy team again, for inviting me to be part of this and hope this was helpful in, in the discussion. Have a good day. So I'll kick it off here. A question for Dan. Just curious, you know, when you're putting these cameras in barns, what would you say is the most common issue that, that you find that producers weren't aware of? Uh, boy, that's a good question. And I think that's one of the main advantages of time-lapse is you get a better idea of what's happening when the managers aren't around, managers and caregivers aren't around. Um, I know in a number of cases, you know, lack of feed, feed out of reach is really common. Um, we do have a number of people that really overcrowd barns out here. Uh, they, I think they're surprised. Uh, with the amount of periods of standing and, and uh, star refusal that, that happens. Uh, those are probably the most common things I come across, Brian. Yeah, I was really interested in your the work you've been doing looking at heat stress. So we, we definitely get questions here in the Midwest on that as well. So really interesting stuff. On that, how many farms have you had now that you would say have 
have actually done that and turned their fans around to see if they can get the cows spread out? Uh, I can probably think about it, uh, at least a dozen at this point. Um, and that's just the ones that I'm in contact with. Um, my uh, colleague, John Tyson, who's actually on the call today or on the webinar today, uh, has had a number of people do it as well. Uh, but uh, it just through observation, it just seems that cows are doing better. I'm doing another one. I'm trying to evaluate this year. Um, one of the barns that I've worked with, a six row barn, is interesting that put cameras in the first year they were in operation and uh, the, the group that was on the north side of the barn, the barn ran east and west, north side of the barn wouldn't use the outside row of stalls from eight in the morning till eight at night. On the south side, they were doing fine. So I decided to look into it a little further. This year, I also put temperature sensors in the barn as well as outside along with the cameras. Um, this year, both groups weren't using the outside row of stalls um, for that, that period of time. And so I think it has something, you know, some people say it might be light and they're trying to get towards the dark, towards the center of the barn because the head to head rows were being populated fine and they were doing it. But, uh, you know, it gets around October, um, they start using the stalls on the outside row again uh, with no problem. And so it's just as much light as there would be in the summer especially on that north side. And so I think it has something to do with, you know, when THI, temperature humidity index gets to some point, then they start to get away from that outside row for some reason. And I'm still analyzing that data. Uh, so I don't have a real good answer yet, but that's my, my suspicion. Well, let, let me know when you get that figured out because we, we definitely need an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, great, great stuff on the airflow. Yeah, I had a question um, on, you know, farms that have employees managing cows, like f pushing up feed or just overall handling, cow handling. Um, do you see farms using these as, as trainings for their employees? I haven't seen that. I don't know if you have, Brian, if it's, I think it's helped again, feed pushback, some of those things that aren't happening that may direct them towards getting that done. But uh, but no, I guess I don't see it as a, a real training tool yet, but it could be. I guess the one example I would have one of the farms they worked with, you know, it's not necessarily a direct employee training tool, but it's more just uh, fine tuning or management. So they had done some uh, feed bunk studies with, with time lapse and realized that they basically needed to change their feeding strategy and their dry call barn. They're just, the cows were away from feed for too long. And so they, they kind of reworked their, their mixing schedule and when they move cows into different pens and things like that, and were able to make some changes there and, you know, saw some significant improvements in feed intake and things like that. So yeah, that's kind of the main way that I've seen them being used specifically to feed at this point. And then Dan or Brian, I think you had you both probably addressed this in your presentations. But when we talk about those boss cows um, and we identify those through the cameras, what are some options that we can we can really reduce that boss cow syndrome? I'll take a stab at it here, and then I'll I'll let Dan go. Uh, that that's a tough one to deal with, you know. If you've got a robotic system and you've got boss cows. I mean, it, it's not a great solution, but the best thing you can do if, if you're designing your facility up front is just have a, di a different group for your, you know, your two-year-olds, and that can help take care of a lot of that. They tend to be your more timid cows. You know, once if you've already got a problem, you know, that's then you can't separate those groups. That's not really a, a great solution. But other than that, I guess you can always just put them on the trailer and sell them too. That, that tends to fix it. There may be an alternative career for them that uh, it's better. Um, well, I think that's a good point. And again, I think it comes to overcrowding. I think you start to get, and especially on the, the facility. I mean, if you're looking at a three row group compared to a two row group, you know, the feed space, as I mentioned, is a lot less. So you'll see more, especially when you start to overpopulate three row groups, you'll start to see that more aggression for both stalls and feed. And so, you know, providing 
that extra feed space or not overpopulating uh, is, is really uh, a good idea. I do see cows uh, taking waterers over. Boss cows will take over a water. And so I think it's really important to have you know, more than one water per group. And what we really like to see is a water trough rather than an individual, you know, kind of a bowl type waterer uh, where they only have a, you know, maybe a foot square or so uh, to get in and water. So that multiple cows can drink at the same time. Uh, but you'll get a, you know, you'll get a, I've seen a number of videos, you'll get a boss cow just stand there and and you know, more timid cows really, they have to go through some gyrations before they can even have access to that water. So providing more water or more water space really limits that. But uh, I would say, you know, most of the aggression comes from uh, lack, of, lack of space, whether it's feed space, resting space, that type of thing. Here, but I just, I really wanna thank everyone for joining in today I thank Dan again for being part of the webinar here and presenting mm -hmm. some good information. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, tune in for the upcoming webinars and okay. have a great Thank day. Thank you, Brian. And thanks for the opportunity, everybody. Take care.